Hi, everyone. Thanks. I see some of you are putting some things in the chat. Nice to see you all. And again, we're uh, we're asking for folks to if um, if you have the capacity to turn on your camera and join us. All right. So as it is 1.30, I'm just going to do a brief introduction. So today we have uh, Rehearsals for Life. It's a interactive theater group from the University of Oregon. Um, they got a chance to present last year the National Conference of Race and Equity, and they do a fantastic job of stimulating great conversation on that topic itself. Guided Pathways wanted to continue those conversations here on our campus, even though we are virtual. And I'm very excited we're able to bring Rehearsal for Life here to Flex of Spring 2022. I would like to give a thank you to Donna Green for organizing this, as well as Dr. Veronica Dott and Angel Moraz, who helped uh, design while working with Rehearsal for Life the scenarios that they will be performing for us as a group. I will be handing it off to Abigail. Um, and she will be leading the conversation throughout the day. So as she mentioned, if you do have the ability to turn your camera on, it helps them out by seeing interactions and engaging more with us as a group. So Abigail, feel free and take it over. Okay. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Abigail Leder. I work at the University of Oregon. I work with the Office of the Dean of Students here and do a lot of work around um, sexual violence prevention and also diversity education. And in that role, I get to work with Rehearsals for Life, which is a group of graduate student actors from a variety of dis different disciplines across campus. Uh, and we meet together regularly and create interactive educational workshops uh, like the one we're gonna do today that is um, that are based on situations and experiences that people have had on different campuses around uh, the country and uh, and experiences that they have had and spend time talking a lot about how do we create a more inclusive campus culture um, and what is it that we as bystanders or we as community members are uh, seeing that isn't particularly working in our community and how can we be uh, better at creating the kind of community that we want together. So um, again, I'm going to keep saying it. I really, it really means a lot to us. If you could please turn on your camera. Um, this is some pretty heartfelt and intense work. And it's important for us that we create a sense of community in our conversations and that we uh, know that we're here. We know that we're paying attention. We know that we're uh, engaged and uh, interested in in creating a better culture uh, on our on our campus. So um, what I'd like to do first is uh, have our actors introduce each other or themselves <laughs> um, and uh, tell you a little bit more about them. So uh, I will turn it over to Bailey. Hi everyone, my name is Bailey McGee. My pronouns are she, her. I am a second year master's student in the Conflict and Dispute Resolution Program. And I joined RFL because it gave me an opportunity to start applying the skills I was learning in my program while also getting to teach them to others. Hi everybody, my name is Koshal Sapkota. My pronouns are he, him. I'm from Nepal. I'm a first year doctoral student of planning and public affairs at the University of Oregon. I joined RFL to question my own privileges while uh, trying to be an ally. Hi folks, uh, my name is Kellum Tate Jones. Today feels like a she, her, hers kind of day. And I am a fifth year Rehearsals for Life member, as well as a fifth year doctoral candidate in the Earth Science Department studying vertebrate paleontology. And I joined Rehearsals for Life because I was looking for a way to marry my creative interests with my interest in disrupting social oppression and promoting liberation. Hi there, I'm Monika Collier. My pronouns are she or they. 
this is my first year in rehearsals for life, as well as I am a first year master's student studying nonprofit management. I actually graduated from Palm Desert High School, so go Aztecs. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah, I joined this program because it's so awesome and it just, it, it feels like a family to me. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Haifa and I am a third year PhD student in the political science department at U of O. I joined Rehearsals for Life um, actually three years ago when I first got here, <laughs> was in their orientation session. Um, and I joined because I have passion and experience in drama for social change and theater of the oppressed. So I wanted to continue doing that here. And I'm really happy that I can do that and do something outside of academia as well. Hi, I'm Chelsea Obeidy. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in the Soil and Water Lab. Um, I, I use she, her pronouns, and I joined RFL um, to practice bystander intervention as well as help others do it too. Hi, y'all. Um, my name is Rory Godek. I'm a second year undergraduate student, a first year RFL member, and I joined RFL to learn more about my own privileges and biases um, and to just be more involved on campus. Hey, everyone. I'm Mark Dejir, and I use he, him pronouns. I joined Rehearsals for Life because I think stories can be really powerful. And I am in my first year of the Prevention Science graduate program here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Philip. I'm an anthropologist who's a law student now. I'm here to help tell stories. Great. So uh, those are our actors. And um, once again, if you're just joining us, I'm going to continue to in keep inviting people to turn your cameras on in an effort to create more community and to share more honest and vulnerable conversations. And um, what we're actually going to start with, um, well, Kellum, do you want to say something? Yes, so as we're getting started, we want to uh, begin with a content warning. Uh, so during our workshop today, uh, we're going to be discussing topics that can be uh, can elicit trauma responses from people who have experienced similar situations. So these topics include eating disorders, sexual violence, racial oppression, uh, discrimination based on ethnicity and accent, and oppressive gender dynamics. Uh, and we encourage you to lean into the, this sort of vulnerable space that is between authentically and self-compassionately taking care of yourselves uh, while also bravely engaging in the discomfort that can lead to connection, belonging, and personal growth. Thanks, Callum. Um, so as you all are educators and work with um, students and have been through the educational process yourself, what we're going to start out by doing is sharing, um, there, we have two of our actors who are going to be sharing their personal stories with you uh, in an effort to think a little bit more about um, the stories and the experiences that we are all bringing to our work together on campus. Um, and sometimes we can see each other as uh, either students or professors or faculty or staff and uh, and there can be divisions in all sorts of ways. And so um, we're, we're just going to take some time to listen to some of the personal stories of two of our students. And so I would suggest um, if you haven't already put you putting your view into speaker view and then when they speak, they will come up. And that's in the top right hand corner for the US me to zoom and uh, yeah, whenever you're ready. The heavy clouds above the wetland prairie are the color of new bruises layered on old bruises. I'm rollerblading down the path that winds through the ephemeral ponds of the nature preserve, but only a few hundred meters down the trail, my skates drag to a miserable stop. 
all of the energy feels completely drained from my body. This is the final term of my fourth year of graduate school, and it's only just started, but I already feel as empty as these ponds will be during the coming dry season. I should be happy, I tell myself sternly. I'm over halfway through my PhD in paleontology, for fuck's sake, that beloved dream of children everywhere, and I'm living it. I'm doing all the things I should, researching, writing, presenting, teaching, serving, mentoring, networking, so I should be happy, but I'm not. As I sit on the side of the trail, I glare enviously at a flock of northern shovel shovelers trolling across the surface of a nearby pond. This is an all-time low, I think. I'm jealous of ducks. But how did I get here, I wonder? How did I go from giving up everything for this life to only wanting to escape it? You really shouldn't eat that. Do you know what it will do to your body? No one will ever love you if you look like you used to. You're nothing if you don't look perfect. I avert my eyes from the burger section of the menu and adjust them to peruse the salads. I'm 13 and this is my first recollection of when my eating disorder, or as I now name it, Eve Dale, and I became acquainted. My days developed into a routine of restriction, self-hatred motivated exercise routines, and scrolling through my social media feeds. I grew more and more disgusted with my body at every Photoshop picture, every daily step onto that scale, every workout that never felt like enough. I was a willing servant of my mind who faithfully strived for the unobtainable approval from Eve. My dedication to molding myself into the most beautiful and flawless person I could be stripped away my bubbly personality, my motivation for school, and my weight until my parents could no longer blame it on a phase, and I landed in an exam room being diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. Nearly four years earlier in late September of 2017, I stand bold as brass atop a sandstone boulder on the Oregon coast. In just a few days, I will begin my graduate degree in earth sciences. Other soon-to-be graduate students clamber across the tilted beds of striated rock, playing in the tossing surf and shouting exclamations to each other about sedimentary structures and weathering patterns. Here on this new grad camping trip, I feel that infinite sense of connection that drew me to earth science and paleontology in the first place, to the surging waves, the shrieking gulls, the stony cliffs, the other students. After my short-lived and unhappy career in nursing, I feel like I have at last come home to my true calling. Over the preceding months and years, this early enthusiasm tarnishes so slowly it's almost imperceptible at first. So much is good, after all. I should be content. I make a few wonderful friends, study fascinating topics, have a great lab group. I should be happy. I teach college classes and summer camps. I commit to service initiatives intended to create a more welcoming, inclusive environment in departmental and university communities. I should be fulfilled. So why aren't I? Is it the omnipresent imposter syndrome always needling me with my inadequacies? Is it feeling responsible for but powerless to create meaningful change around entrenched racism, sexism, and ableism? Is it the competitiveness and scarcity mindset of academia that promotes bullying and backstabbing over collaboration and community? Or is it despite the fact that I have uprooted my whole life to pursue this dream because I just don't belong here? Don't do it. Don't you dare eat the food on that plate. Everything you have ever worked for is on the line. Your parents and doctors are full of shit. I gulp. The thoughts are extra loud today. 
Eve is pissed at me. I have been compliant with the rules imposed by the partial hospitalization program I had been admitted into for the second time that year. It's mealtime. Myself and the other patients shuffle to the dining room. The tables are covered with fidget toys and little notes of encouragement. I look down at a positive affirmation note near my spot. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. How do I swim when I'm constantly drowning and flailing though? The timer starts, the games begin. The darting eyes of comparison amongst the patients fly under the therapist's notice. I swallow a bite and am bombarded with assaults of disappointment and fury. My head feels like it's going to burst as the thoughts of myself, Eve, and my support system fight a brutal war inside. It would just be so much easier if I wasn't here. I would no longer be a burden to my parents and siblings. I would no longer break myself at every imperfection with my grades, words, and actions. What if I just wasn't here anymore? Who would even miss me? By the end of last spring term, I am just about ready to follow my desire for escape right out of my paleontology career forever. But I remember the golden shining feeling of that day on the coast. And I think that was real. I owe it to that conviction and to the past four years of work to give it one last try. So for once, instead of redoubling my efforts, I decide to take a break last summer, a real break to see if I can rekindle the passion that once glowed where numbness now hangs like a sodden blanket. With my email app disabled and my laptop powered down, I let myself rest. I camp alone for 10 days in the desert, hiking sand dunes and basalt canyons beneath the watchful eyes of golden eagles and prairie falcons. I spend time with people who love me just for being me. I journal and garden and skate and rock hound and hammock and read. I really wish that I could stand here today and tell you that I've gotten this whole thing figured out. I haven't, and I'm still struggling, but I am beginning to feel flickers of my original passion again, still dim but growing stronger and stronger, sparking when I get my code to run or connect with an undergraduate or discuss my, discuss my postgraduate plans in bringing storytelling to earth science. And I remind myself every day that regardless of what papers I should be reading or events I should be participating in or causes I should be serving, my first priority has to be myself. A garden cannot be watered with an empty bucket. And until I have what I need, I can give nothing back. What am I doing? How can I sit here and let my brain berate myself when I can be so much more? I only have one life and so many dreams. Why am I wasting all of that on the impossible goal of perfection? I'm almost startled. Well, this is new, I think. This is not the familiar menacing voice of Eve. I vaguely recognize it, but can't really place it. It's refreshing, like a breath of crisp wintry air. I cling on to the first hopeful thoughts I've had in way too long. Maybe, just maybe, all the hours of therapy are working. Maybe the exercises of reworking my hateful self-directed reprimands, the assertive communication practices, the mindfulness lessons, the relapse prevention sessions are actually working. Maybe just Maybe it was Eve that sucked the energy, passion, and capability from my body so they could thrive like a parasite. Maybe this moment is the shift. Is this a glimpse of my old self making a reappearance? I am enough. I am capable. I am worthy. I am loved. These are some of my rotating mantras that I begin my days with now. 
I would love to say that ever since I was reunited with my old self, it has been smooth sailing. But as with most things, the work has never ended. I still fall victim to society's harmful and unrealistic beauty standards into a cycle of beratement and negativity. Even on my days of struggle though, I don't let it embody me completely as it once did. I am a person in chronic recovery who will always strive to appreciate my body. The toxicity of today's impossible standards led me down a path where I lost my, where I lost my way and almost myself. With some weed whacking, some bruises and stings though, I cleared a new path for myself. But it is not just one for me. I know I am not alone. This is a journey that I tread with others' hands entwined with mine. You are enough. You are capable. You are worthy. And you are loved. Thank you. Thank you, Aurora and Callum. And y'all want to come back to gallery view. And again, we really want to invite folks to turn your cameras on and connect in community with us. So I am curious um, and would love to hear from some of you what, uh, what struck you about these stories? What could you relate to in terms of your work on campus or your own uh, professional or academic life? Um, we just, it, it, uh, it's nice to hear some reflections from the audience around uh, anything that it's spurred in you in relation to your work on campus. Y'all can put things in the chat too. I guess I'll chime in. My name is Olympia. Hi. And um, I guess uh, two fall semesters ago, I had a student that I felt perhaps suffered from anorexia. Um, I, I teach architecture, it's pretty demanding. And they, uh, they go through a lot of stress, uh, peaks and valleys, my students. And I could tell that that uh, she was, you know, extremely, extremely thin, and um, wouldn't partake in some things that were available at the studio. And uh, always being in a rush to leave, someone was always expecting her. Extremely boxed in. It felt like to me that she was very boxed in by her environment, very limited. Um, and somehow she could crack a smile at, on occasion. I, I just urged her to, to work because she had talent, you know, and I could tell she liked what she was doing, but uh, I just could see the, um, the sadness inside. Thank you, Olympia. Anyone else, any reflections, thoughts about the students you work with? or your own career, or just an appreciation for Callum and Roy for telling their stories. Hey, Maloney, um, yeah, I appreciate both of you sharing your stories, just how visceral they were um, was really captivating. And it just it reminds me that as an educator, I don't know everything that students are bringing to their educations and to really to really pause and and, and remember that the different struggles and experiences that each student brings to their education. Thank you. So part of why we start like this is that uh, to remind us that we all have lives outside of our professional uh, and academic lives and uh, that we're coming together 
uh, and that oftentimes uh, our own identities and our own life stories really impact our experiences and how we perceive the world and how we are perceived by the world. And we spend um, <clears throat> time and rehearsal. How, about, how many of you have heard of the words microaggressions? Uh, as, as a so. Yeah, the sort of the idea that there are like these small things that are happening that um, that build up over time. And one of the I, I heard recently, instead of microaggressions, people have been using uh, the concept of subtle acts of exclusion. And that sounded really uh, hit home to me and that um, that can create an environment um, where students don't don't oh, and faculty and staff cannot feel included that they feel excluded from uh, the work that we're doing and from their uh, education uh, based on subtle things that are happening constantly and so um, we spend our time thinking about well what could we do if we saw something that uh, we, we overheard something or saw something that was a subtle act of exclusion. What, what do you do? What is your role uh, from wherever you are in your position to intervene uh, and change the outcome? And so uh, how many of you have uh, been in situations where you think that you wish you had said something, you knew you should have said something, but you, just in retrospect, like had, well, you had no idea what you wanted to say. And maybe in retrospect, you thought of a few things. Anyone relate to that? Like the, like, oh, I, if I had only said this. Um, so what we do is we actually practice, give it, we try to slow down and think about what are the dynamics in these different situations and what is our role and how might we actually shift something. Um, so I feel curious, how many of you, um, you can hold up your hands on a scale of like one to five, feel super comfortable intervening when you hear someone, a stranger saying something uh, that is uh, sexist or racist or homophobic, how comfortable do you feel intervening? So on a scale of one to five, so, or zero to five, like how, Okay, threes, some fours, some twos. Great. Um, yeah, put in the chat too if you're if, if around uh, if a stranger. So five is totally comfortable, and three and zero is like not comfortable at all. So I would love to hear from some of you like why you intervene or why you don't intervene. And you can just uh, unmute yourself and just chime in. Y'all are shy today. Uh, well, okay, I'll start. Okay, I, I put myself as a as a one, and said I'm very unlikely to intervene because I feel like that. I'm just, I'm going to put myself in a position to be um, easily attacked. Um, and that whenever, if I, because I, I remember I have said things in the past, but then it's like, then whatever is happening in that situation that gets directed at me. And I don't know how to manage that. I don't know how to handle that. And, or, you know, they start to pick apart me as a person or like, well, or they question whatever it is that I'm saying, and I'm not quite sure how to vocalize what they said was incorrect. Mm -hmm. And, and I've been in situations where people have done things to me, have asked me racist questions, and I tell them that what they're saying is racist. And they tell me that it's not, and that I'm wrong, and that they do it all the time, and that I just need to get over it. And so I don't know how to combat that. So I've just learned to shut my mouth. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christina. I think you're speaking to a lot of the concerns and why 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 we don't say things. That those are definitely some of them, and there there are actual real consequences to speaking up sometimes. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, yeah, I put five um, because my mama bear gets triggered really easily and I maybe don't have great judgment, <laughs> but uh, the, the, there are a couple things that do stop me from 
sometimes intervening. Number one, I don't think that fast. <laughs> personal flaw. And number two, a lot of times I don't know, I don't feel qualified in the situation uh, to know what to say. Mm -hmm. But I have on multiple occasions, um, I could say gotten myself into a kind of uncomfortable situations and had that aggression turned on like towards me mm -hmm. by intervening. And I, I feel fine with that. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that really what is lacking for me is the knowledge of like specific groups of people that I am not part of, uh, what is actually like, when should I step in? I step in when I feel something is wrong, but, um, but you know, sometimes I feel like it's like helping in the wrong way or the way that would not be preferred by that person because I'm not aware of their perspective. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Right, there's, it's so tricky, right? And there are uh, lots of different factors that are play based on your own identity, uh, based on how you're feeling that day, based on your own personal safety as Wendy named. Um, having a strategy can also be really helpful. Christine mentioned. Uh, Linda, did you have something you wanted to say? I see your hand up, but not sure if that was just from the earlier exercise. Okay. All right. Um, so now I want you to do the same exercise. Hold up your hand uh, from a five down to a zero. Five is super comfortable. Zero is uh, less comfortable or not comfortable at all. Um, when you are among colleagues, so five, really comfortable. Okay, I see a lot of threes and fours, some fours and fives in the chat. Uh, could anyone speak to why you, if you changed from a stranger, if you're, you know, your comfort level changed between stranger and a colleague or you know what are some of the things that y'all are thinking about in relation to colleagues i think the expectations are different among colleagues mm -hmm. there are certain things that i expect them to know or to be aware of or to be sensitive to and the, the thing that prompts prompts me to intervene is because you can always discuss it on a feeling level. Mm -hmm. What do you think it would feel like if this was said to you? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not so much knowing how to follow up with factual information or being able to specifically identify, but to talk about it from a feeling level. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ron. That can be a really fabulous strategy to talk about how, how you're feeling and how explore how other people are feeling. Yeah. Any other comments about faculty or, or sorry, colleagues? I just wanted to add, because I was the one who um, had mentioned um, strangers, you know, or not. I don't care what other people think in general. So if I'm around strangers, like I'll definitely intervene and I'll say whatever needs to be said and I'll try to diffuse or, you know, but the moment you have other people, there, there's there's a lot more to lose, at least for me, you know, you don't want to ruin relationships. You don't want to make people feel stupid. You don't want to make people feel picked on. And so it's, it's a very much more of a delicate balance of respecting everyone and making people feel good while still trying to correct the, the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And the, the, the next question I have for y'all is if it, this is a supervisor or uh, someone that uh, has been around a whole lot longer than you, someone that has power uh, over you in some way, if you could either type in the chat or raise your hand, how comfortable do you feel? Okay, I'm seeing some O's, some twos, some fives. We're sort of all over the map and for some you've moved. So I'd love to hear from some of you, like why you moved, uh, what or what are some of the considerations that you have now? Um, 
I can jump in on that one. Mm -hmm. um, with colleagues and strangers, I'm not sure I feel on a solid footing, <clears throat> but as a tenured professor um, to administration, I feel pretty comfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, the, the power dynamic is just very different. Mm -hmm. Right, so you have some power in that situation as well. A little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I'm not as fearful of retaliatory, and, and I always try to um, be respectful, regardless of who it is, mm -hmm. but I just feel more comfortable. Right, right. And then the question is, uh, do the folks without tenure feel as comfortable? And, and they may not, they may certainly may not. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I see that the uh, Jean or Dini, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but if it's saying way too much at stake, so it depends on the relationship. Absolutely. Jenny, great. Um, what else? What are some of my other thoughts around uh, the power dynamics in relation to these sorts of conversations? I mean, I'm, I am an adjunct, so I have very little authority and I, uh, you know, come from non-credit. So we have even less say when it comes to academia. And I know that I've had directors or bosses say racist things. And I don't know what to say because I want to say like, hey, you know, what does a Mexican look like? You know, or like something like that. And I purposely shut my mouth because I don't want to be known as like oh the minority who gets all round up or I don't want to be like ostracized or castrated or you know ostracized as, as being the the whiny minority I think that being a brown person and being a woman I have it's even more delicate for me is that I'm I mean I think I feel like that my colleagues and my bosses genuinely do respect me and like me as, a, as an employee but I still do have that voice in the back of my head that says you're just gonna be stereotyped they're just gonna get mad at you for you know they're gonna like you even less so I am the, I'm going to be the first to say, I'll first to shut my mouth if my boss is anything racist and which is sucks, but I don't really know how to fight that dynamic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christina and Jenny speaking. Yeah. The, um, there are a lot of different stakes for different folks, depending on your identities and depending on your, uh, power within the institution and, uh, so I just want to name that because I, that is super important in terms of how we are speaking up and also how we are using places where we do have power or privilege to be active bystanders and active allies to the folks that have less. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're actually going to move into a scene. Uh, we're going to show you a scene with a hiring committee. And what, it, what we want you to do is think about the scene and think about what you might potentially do or say if you were also on this hiring committee. Um, so we're gonna watch the scene through. You can put uh, back into, uh, actually, I'm gonna ask you to turn your cameras off for the first run through, and then we'll turn our cameras back on. So if you could turn your cameras off, Okay, so now that we've interviewed the final two potential candidates for the position, let's discuss them. Yeah, I can, I can start. I just want to say I wasn't really impressed with Gwen. I was expecting to be more taken with her. Yeah, I totally agree. She had some good teaching evaluations, but her accent was a little too strong, and she told really long stories. Actually, I... I really enjoyed her stories. Oh, well, I mean, it just made me like kind of uncomfortable, like how she got that personal. And to be honest, I couldn't even understand her most of the time. Like her vocabulary was even off a little bit. I feel the exact same way. I mean, did you notice she kept using the word outcomes when she definitely meant to say impacts? Oh my gosh, yes, I heard that. And she spent so much time talking about her service contributions, which don't get me wrong, I think it's amazing. 
but I am concerned that that kind of passion might interfere with her productivity. I was thinking the same thing. And also it kind of came off braggy. But it looks like Gwen is a top candidate in several areas. And the provost does want us to recruit more diverse employees who are qualified. Well, of course we're going to consider equity, but we also need to consider the needs of our department. Okay, we're gonna freeze here and invite y'all to turn your cameras back on. And let's uh, talk a little bit about this scene. So what are you noticing? You can call it out, put it in the chat. Just like, let's just like name the dynamics. They're making comments on the way on her uh, English speaking abilities. Absolutely. Yep. Making comments on her English speaking abilities or accents, very little about her qualifications, lots of bias. Two of the committee members seem to be bullying the other members. I think that sometimes when people make comments on the subtleties of vocabulary choice, I feel like that if you're going to nitpick something that small, then I think that it's sidestepping the, the direct, uh, it's sidestepping the, all the other qualifications of the, of the candidate. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not in any of your fields, but that, oh, outcomes versus impacts, um, you know, to, to go that far to, uh, in, in an interview, um, mean girl attitudes, yeah, cultural and linguistic bias. So what do you do, right? Like, so if you're on a hiring committee and this conversation is happening, let's just brainstorm together. Like, what are some things you can potentially do or say, given who you are, given your role, on campus, your identity, uh, you know, your race, your ethnicity. What, what, what would, what could you potentially do or say? Hi, um, I would just take the opportunity to talk about the candidates' actual um, qualifications, and um, if I thought that she was a good candidate for all of the reasons that um, she was qualified for, then I would take the opportunity to discuss those. And then also maybe point out that it doesn't obviously matter for the job if she has an accent. Great, thanks. So you would stick to the qualifications, yeah. What are some other ideas? Are there other ways that um, we could approach this? Wendy, did you have something? Well, I would remind the committee that the College of the Desert is um, committed to diversity and that perhaps the students identify with um, the, mi the minority students would identify and see themselves with this um, candidate. Mm -hmm. Other ideas? I do. I, I would ask that we revisit the explicit expectations of our hirees and try to really diagnose like how much of that is is interpreted as based on our own cultural comfort. Patients the same as we with disabilities or who might be on the spectrum. Who might be on the spectrum. Scarlett. Sorry, uh, Alice. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, but that's, I would try to stick to the actual explicit expectations and break that down. Mm -hmm. How, um, so here, my, and my next question to all of you is like, how would you do any of these things, right? Like, so it can be easier to think in retrospect, like, oh, I would do this or I would do this. And in the moment it becomes trickier. Um, and what we're going to do right now is actually up the stakes a little bit more and have us give us a chance to actually practice having some of these conversations, like imagining we're all in this hiring committee meeting and we need to uh, steer the ship in a different direction from the way it's going. And so what we're going to do is we are going to show the scene again, and we're going to all imagine that we're there. Um, and we're going to uh, invite people 
to intervene. You can say stop when you want the scene to, uh, to stop and to pause, and then you can get a chance to um, practice having some of these tougher conversations. And we also wanna create an environment in this Zoom room that where we are super supportive of everyone who's willing to try anything because we know that this stuff is really tricky and you can't always get it right. And actually most of the time you might get it wrong and that there's no perfect way to intervene in any of these situations. But we wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what are the potential gains and losses of some of these interventions. So we're gonna practice. Um, so, uh, so we're gonna show the scene. When you have an idea of something you wanna potentially say or try, say stop and uh, we'll take it back a sentence or two and give you the opportunity to practice. So uh, we're gonna watch this scene again. Okay, so now that we've interviewed the final two potential candidates for the position, let's discuss them. Yeah, I, I can start. I just wanna say that I wasn't really impressed with Gwen. I was expecting to be more taken with her. Yeah, I totally agree. She had some good teaching evaluations. But All right, Ron, I see you, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, can we stop there? Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you share with us what your expectations are that work that? I just thought it was like a little hard to understand her. And I'm just thinking about the students who would have a really hard time like listening to her lectures. I understood her just fine. I like her vocabulary was even off. I just like am worried that um, and like she talked about her service contribution so much, like that kind of uh, passion could. Hi, could we go back to the qualifications for this candidate and perhaps review those and what we are really discussing? Okay, I'm gonna pause you here. Great job, Ron and um, MG, how do you, is that? Okay, great. So. Uh, Ron, do you want to say anything about what that was like for you or how what your strategy was? I wanted to hear more about what her expectation, because obviously when she saw her, she had these expectations. What were those <laughs> that immediately once she started talk, talk, interviewing that she was disappointed? What was she expecting? Was it realistic? Yeah, great questions. Yeah. And MG, do you want to say anything about what that was like or what your strategy was? Um, yeah, it's 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 hard. It's always hard to to jump in, I think, because um I um am older than the the, the students who were talking. I felt like I had some power where I could come in and try to redirect the conversation. It's, I mean, it's once that their conversation is going that way, it's, I mean, it's microaggressions. Um, so I, I, but it's, I also would know it's not the time maybe to educate on that, but to really redirect instead. Yeah, thank you. So what were some of the gains uh, that Ron and MG had in this intervention? What did they gain? I think one of the things that they did was that they stopped the traction. They were able to like make the um, the negativity and the you know microaggressions or the criticism kind of just like stop. And then, especially with MG, made it become you know reflect it and think on something else instead of continuing on that thread. Because I, when it comes to like conversations, like everybody wants to join in and continue a conversation going forward in the same topic, so there's a sense of cohesion. But then it's those sort of like that conversation behavior, which, you know, persists in, you know, the racism and the microaggressions or the sexism and then MG definitely and, and Ron stopped that. And I think that's the biggest thing to do it is because that's the most helpful action, because I don't think that we realize that the conversation is progressing in a negative direction many times. Mm -hmm. 
I think I, I want to say that they gained a lot because they gave the candidate the respect and the worth that she deserved. And with that, they're gaining a good consciousness. It's the right thing to do. And they were speaking the truth and going off of areas that are important to do when, when you're in an, an interview. So they're gaining a lot. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any potential losses? What are some of the potential losses of intervening in this way? I don't think, I think what potential loss is that um, in such a short situation, you, you don't really get the, the two main characters, Rory and Bailey, they didn't get the opportunity to really see what they were doing wrong. It was just more of like, re, all we were able to do was just redirect the conversation. But I think in a short conversation, it's really difficult to get somebody to be self-reflective. All you can do is redirect. Right. Great point. Great point. I mean, I think you're right in terms of sometimes all we can do is actually just get the behavior to stop in the moment and not cause any more harm than is already happening. Uh, and then other times there is more of an opportunity for an educational moment. Um, I'm curious though, if anyone has an idea for a potential way to have an educational moment with these people. Like what are some of the things, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about this because um, at least when I was hired, I'm, I'm an adjunct and I'm retired architect that got back into teaching. But um, so I, uh, besides that, um, when I was hired, there, there was a committee that had a, a list of questions. They, as a matter of fact, they gave me these questions before I got into the committee room. And I had to quickly answer them. And all they did was go over each one of them and listen in my own words, what I quickly wrote five minutes before I walked in the room. And there was nothing, once that was done, they thanked me and I walked out. And my, on my way out, I said, I, I brought all these things with me. There were drawings, there were reports and there were feasibility studies. I said, I wanted you to know that I'm the real thing. And they kind of laughed and said, well, this uh, process doesn't allow for that. And I was hired afterwards, but I always remember my parting comment that I wanted them to know that I was the real thing, mm. you know? And I, I just never got that opportunity because it was such a tightly knit and very neutral process of uh -huh. uh, evaluating. Yeah. So then the, the question for all of you is like, what, what can you do to support the candidates even more in this, in this dynamic? Um, does anybody have an idea of something you would wanna try? Like if you were on the committee and you wanted to sort of explain to uh, Bailey and Rory uh, why their uh, comments aren't okay. Yes, I'll chime in here and I'm more piggybacking off of someone that mentioned in the chat was when they make a comment about that they personally had more difficult to understand the accent, uh, some of the chat made, but what are the students that may understand that individual better based off of their own personal exposure? So by sharing that, you're sharing your own personal interpretation of it, um, but your own personal interpretation does not um, qualify to understand for all students or all people they may be discussing with. Mm -hmm. And Matthew, would you feel comfortable saying that in a committee meeting? Maybe not to that le uh, length, but mentioning that um, some students may um, uh, identify or be more comfortable with that, or for them, it may not sound like an accent, it may be what they're used to. So mm -hmm. it, an accent is uh, completely um, individualized to what you're used to lip hearing. So it's yeah, I guess it's all about the comfort level in that individual group. But I think uh, the importance is understanding that no two individuals will hear everything the same way. Yeah, thank you. 
what else are, is there anything else that you all noticed in Aurora and Bailey's comments that feel like it's important that we maybe if, even if we don't address them right now that we just name the fact of like what they're doing here um I I felt like um I, I read in the comments after I made my comment I felt that the there's always that one person in the room who sets the tone and it influences the direction of the conversation. And that's why you need to stop it and name it. And then, you know, maybe have the discussion as to, well, what's going on here? Are we talking about qualifications? Are we talking about personality? We can't talk about personality because that's illegal. So let's go back to the conversation and put aside our personal opinions and just talk about the qualifications for the position. So. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, there are interesting dynamics here, right? It seems like people are worried about upsetting or going against the group uh, person, you know, what Roger is pointing out. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I, I think what we want to point out here is that there are many different ways to address this. We don't want to sort of leave here thinking, oh, there's no way to do this. Like based on your own experience, your own identity, your own role on campus, you have the opportunity to perhaps shift the dynamic and shift the conversation. And whether it's in small ways or bigger ways, I mean, I could also imagine well, yeah, so that's, um, I, like, I want to move on to another scene, but I want to make sure that we're capturing uh, anything else that needs to be said about this particular scene. Um, I, I just want one... to... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Don. I was just going to say, um, one of the points where they mentioned that she was bragging about all of her service, I, I definitely would be trying to turn that around and reminding them that what's well, a job interview. A, you're supposed to brag, and B, don't we want that kind of passion? Yeah. I'm not, I'm seeing where that's a negative. So I definitely would have pushed back against that awesome. strongly. Thank you, Donna. Christina? I feel like in my own personal experience when it comes to telling people about their, or trying to point out biases or trying to like, you know, besides just stopping the conversation, but redirecting it, it's, really hard in my experience for me to do that with white people it's very very hard I feel like that white people have an easier time telling other white people the you know the biases and the problems in their ways I think that as a dark-skinned person I try to tell white people that what they're saying is racist and they just think that I'm oversensitive and then they and then they, as I had mentioned earlier then the attack comes to me so I'm like I have no idea how to turn that around from my position yeah Thank you, Christina. And I think you're speaking to something really important that, you know, where the places that we hold privilege, it's an opportunity and a responsibility for us to be trying to shift those dynamics for the folks that don't feel like they can say something in that moment. And uh, so I want to encourage uh, those of us that have more power and privilege uh, to take it on. And uh, and here that you, you just heard really clearly that one of your peers doesn't feel comfortable saying that. Uh, and so it's, it's your role, it's our role um, to be allies as well. I wanted to add something too, I think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Um, sometimes you don't necessarily have to like call people out or call things or expressly say things. Sometimes a really pointed question, even made in like humor sometimes can really just break things up and then no one's on the defensive. You know, like when they were talking about her accent, um, someone could jump in like, oh, I love her accent. Mm -hmm. You know, it was great. Or, you know, what's wrong with that? And, and turn it back onto them and make them be the one to have to explain themselves and make them the ones start to feel a little bit awkward that maybe they're Exactly, like playing dumb, like, oh, I, I, I don't get it, mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then it puts the onus on the other person, and then they almost dig themselves a hole, you know, and so sometimes it can be really nice strategy to just, yeah, play dumb, turn whatever they're trying to criticize into a really positive thing that you really like, like, oh, I love that, what's wrong with that, and then make them feel kind of weird. <laughs> Thank you for that, because I was trying to find a way to phrase turning it into a positive, like, 
that accent tells you more about that person. Why, why is that a problem? I like the way you phrase that, Denny. Yeah, I've actually been given that advice before in a situation, Denny, to turn it on them. What did you like about her accent? Mm-hmm. And have them contextualize. And that's where it also comes forward. So I, I think that's very powerful. Yeah. And uh, I also see that Cheryl is suggesting, you know, saying that I don't feel comfortable with what's being said right now. I mean, that's a, a whole other tactic, um, but certainly can be a valuable one. Um, all right, I wanna move on to our next scene. So we're gonna show you a scene right before a Zoom meeting. And um, we're gonna turn our cameras off unless you're in the scene. And then, Hey everyone, uh, it's good to see you all this afternoon. Um, we're just going to wait a couple of more minutes for people to trickle in and then we'll get the meeting started. Sounds good. So anybody have any weekend plans? Uh, not much, honestly. I just want to have a drink or two and forget about uh, COVID for at least one night. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I feel like I've been looking forward to Friday night since Monday morning. Uh, hey, Chelsea, are you okay? You seem quiet. Yeah, I guess. I just I just had a really intense experience this weekend, and it has, has me pretty shaken up. Hmm. What happened? Well, I was on my way home from the store, and I got pulled over by this police officer. I'm just, I'm sick, of, I'm sick of feeling really, like, racially targeted. That sucks, but... I don't know, maybe you had a taillight out or maybe you were speeding. Um, I don't know, no. Well, uh, like what kind of officer was it? Were they state police or the sheriff's department? I mean, I don't know, I, I, was, I was shaken, but why does that even matter? I mean, either way, they were just doing their job. They're looking out for our safety. There's no need to blow it out of proportion. If you don't focus on it, it won't bother you. I uh, don't, I don't think that's how it works. I do. I think you should just let it go and stop taking it so personally. Yeah. And like, I mean, I don't know, like with everything that's happening at the border and all the gun violence that we're having, I don't know. I just feel Mm -hmm. like the police are doing their jobs to protect our community. Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry. Uh, sorry to bring it up. It's cool. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So maybe we just get the meeting started. Okay, let's all come back to the group. Uh, these scenarios exactly are uh, are here to uh, make us cringe and also inspire us to act. Right. So we're we're seeing some um, things minimizing her experience. Yikes, a form of microaggressions. What other reactions are you having? What was problematic about this scene? It just made me mad that they were invalidating something that she felt deeply because they've never experienced it in their lives. Mm -hmm. They don't know where she's coming from. They can't possibly have understood it. I just wanted to give her a hug. (laughs) They didn't really listen to her. She, she received no support at all and 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 it really just almost blamed her for the situation mm-hmm. yeah yeah does this seem realistic i see that someone even put in the chat something similar has happened to that oh, realistic <laughs> please <laughs> yeah all right so then what do we do when we overhear this happening yeah, a lot of people speaking about what this has happened to you. Yeah. Yeah. Ron, did you have something you wanted to say or more? Or? This is so commonplace. And I've spent so much of my life explaining this very scenario to people who just don't get it. And their presuppos- presuppositions start with. Well, they're just doing their job. You know, this is what they're supposed to do. 
not even recognizing this is a reality that I have to deal with just because of my paint job, my color. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ron. Uh, Elizabeth, did you have something else? Yeah, I was going to say that it happened to me, this exact scenario happened to me in a professional development. And um, I actually responded to her by explaining that I don't like carrying around my, you know, my purchase receipt to prove that it's my car and, you know, and all of the different scenarios or uh, that, that I've experienced, not just by campus police, but also not here though, but uh, other campus police and by the sheriff. So, and I, and it was a more confrontational because she actually laughed um, mm -hmm. initially. And, and I didn't, I, I'm not a confrontational person, but it struck such a chord at how insensitive one could be when someone is sharing their experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's all too easy for people who've never experienced something like that to not sympathize. And they don't mean to be insensitive and they don't mean to be, and I'm not trying to defend them. I'm just explaining that people just really don't get it. And I had an experience where I, I was pulled over by, by a police officer for no good reason at all. And I was driving under the speed limit. I mean, you know, like, like no reason at all. And then he came and he explained why he pulled me over, which is not a valid reason. I even spoke to a cop friend. So, I mean, there was like no reason. So I was really upset about this particular stop and I posted it on Facebook and I just said, this is a problem, you know? And I had a lot of people tell me, well, you're fine. It's not a big deal. So get over it. Like nothing happened to you, you know? And I had a lot of people say that. Fast forward to, um, you know, a year and a half ago when George Floyd was murdered, I actually had someone, I posted something about George Floyd and then they wrote on my Facebook, they said, Jenny, when you posted about that cop stop that you experienced years ago, I didn't think anything of it. Mm. Now I get it. Like now I see that these stops can lead, they can escalate, you know, and, and I'm so sorry that I invalidated and I dismissed your experience. I just didn't get it. And so I think we have to keep talking about it because the more people hear about it, the more they realize, and even if it hasn't happened to them, they start to make those connections. So mm -hmm. I'll share that. Thanks. So the, then, so the question is like, okay, so what do you do if you're, um, you know, you're, you're in that meeting too. You're sitting around waiting for people, you see this happen uh, to you, Chelsea. What is your role in, in shifting this dynamic? So we're gonna show it again. We're gonna keep our cameras on. I'll be here in this conversation and imagine that you're also in the meeting and feel free to jump in or just say stop. Hi folks, we're gonna go ahead uh, and get the meeting started here in a few minutes once we've had a few more people trickle in. Sounds good. So anybody have any weekend plans? Uh, not much, honestly. I just want to have a drink or two and forget about COVID for at least one night. <laughs> right? Like. Oh, man, with the case counts and everything, I feel like I've been looking forward to Friday night since Monday morning. Hey, Chelsea, are you OK? You seem quiet. Yeah, I, I just had this really intense experience this weekend and has me pretty shaken up. What happened? Well, I was on my way home from the store and I got pulled over by this officer and I'm just I'm sick of feeling racially targeted. Oh, that sucks, but I don't know. Maybe you had a tail light out or maybe you were speeding. No. Well, like what kind of officer was it? Were they sheriff's department or state? It doesn't matter what kind of cop it was. It's, it's terrible, Chelsea, I'm, I'm sorry, are you okay? I mean, 
like I just like every time I see a cop now I, my like stomach feels uncomfortable and I'm just like running through the situation in my head thank you for asking me I mean I don't I don't oh. think they meant it that way though I think they were just doing their job I mean they're looking out for our safety it's kind and of not that safe. go ahead <laughs> It's kind of not the point. The cops got is just to wait and see who they catch doing nothing but following the law. Uh, I I feel so much better that they pulled over Chelsea because you know how much of a danger she is. I'm so sorry, Chelsea. (laughs) All right, I'm going to pause it here and then I'm going to, Josephine Dow, is that how you? No. Dope. Um, I'm going to give you a chance um, once we debrief this one to to do the intervention that you were planning. So. so Christina and Alham, uh, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly either. Um, if, do you, either of you wanna say what your strategy was or what that was like for you? Alham, you wanna go first? Uh, I don't really have a strategy. I just say whatever popped into my head. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear I, I, what. Could you repeat what you said? I didn't catch it in the scene, if you don't mind. What I said, I actually, I don't know. I said something like, yeah, the cop's job today is to just like hide and wait for people who aren't even breaking the law. I think for me, it was first like a valid, first it was about validating her emotion because I mean, she looks distraught and upset enough. And I think no matter what actual situation happened or who's actually in the wrong, when somebody has like a genuine emotional reaction, I think the important thing is to validate them and validate their emotions regardless of what happened. Because then I I feel like when you're uh, like, what kind of cop was it? Well, you know, what were you doing wrong? It's like, you're just trying to tell them that their emotions, regardless of what they actually did is, is wrong and invalid. So I was trying to validate first. Thank you. Uh, So let's talk about the gains and losses from an intervention of that nature. What do you mean by gains? Well, what did, what did they gain by doing that? What, what, um, what, how did that change the situation in a way that might be useful? And I think we've already spoken to a number of them that they, you know, it was validating uh, for Chelsea. They might be able to feel uh, like they actually said something as opposed to, um, you know, letting it go by. But yeah, what were, what were some of the positive outcomes of that kind of intervention? Well, I think for Chelsea, it it gave her allies in the room who who could voice maybe something that she was not able to voice because she was too close to too close to the situation, having been the person who, who was the target basically. Mm -hmm. So she, she, it it might've given it, you know, with the conversation going a little bit longer, it might've given her the opportunity to actually say, yeah, it doesn't really matter what kind of cop it was or what, you know, what I might've done. It's the fact of the way I felt it's the way it made me feel mm-hmm. and that I go through this all the time and I'm, I'm over it. And to give her the, the ability to say what she's really feeling without interruption. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I see um, that a lot of people have been chiming in like, oh yeah, I can totally empathize with that experience. And I also um, just want to bring to Kellum's note about how being profiled based on your race can be more traumatizing and comes with a lot more cultural history and baggage um, than not. So I I just wanted to name that. And I I also really appreciate all the empathy that we are giving each other for situations where that has happened to you and you feel it's intense and hard. Um, I think we should try another intervention. Let's do that scene again. We can maybe skip to uh, Chelsea telling her, her story and doubt if you want to um, intervene and just join like as if you're in the meeting, go for it. Chelsea? Yeah, I just had this really intense experience this weekend and it has me pretty shaken up. What happened? 
Well, I was on my way home from the store and I got pulled over by this officer. And I'm just sick of feeling racially targeted. That sucks, but I don't know. Maybe you had a tail light out or maybe you were speeding. But that doesn't really matter uh, what, what it uh, was. It's what she feels like. Yeah, right there right? you minimized her story. You minimized her feelings by, yeah. by redirecting the conversation. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just confused on why it's like, if that if that is true, she was like speeding, then it's not really racially targeted. They're just, you know, looking out for other people's safety. But that's not what she said. She wasn't talking about that. She was talking about how she felt and what made her feel that way. Yeah, I guess this is this is an interesting point because I don't know. I I guess my first response is that, you know, our 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 police officers are putting their lives on the line for our safety, but yeah, I, I hear I hear what y'all are saying too. I guess, yeah, Chelsea, how have you how have you been feeling? Okay, I'm gonna pause it here. Uh, anyone want, uh, Dow or um, Miley, do you want to share how anything about that experience from you? Well, I think the second she said maybe it was a taillight or maybe it was that, I think that was the second right there when it went left, uh, right. <laughs> I think that that was the moment that she minimized mm -hmm. um, the whole situation. Mm -hmm and Chelsea's feelings. Mm -hmm. So it happened right in early in the conversation. It didn't even need to go any farther. Right, thank you. And it, and it helped Callum um, to sort of stop and think about what she would have said after the fact. Like maybe she wouldn't have said, well, what kind of a cop was it? Was it a sheriff or a whatever? Yeah, exactly. Like it, it obviously it didn't seem to make much of an impact on Bailey, but it seems like it might have made an impact on Callum, which um, is important to recognize, right? Like sometimes we're not going to get everyone on board from a quick intervention. Um, sometimes there's going to be losses. We might not necessarily, you know, Bailey and Callum might never really want to talk to us again. Um, and that can be tricky based on positionality for sure. Um, but I, I am curious uh, sort of for any of the actors within the scene, if there's anything you wanna say about what that was like for you, gains or losses. Chelsea, if you wanna say anything. I mean, I clearly felt supported and validated and it kind of made me feel like I wasn't never not going to bring up this kind of situation with these people again it's like oh i know who to go to now where i can be heard callum i'm curious what happened for your character uh well my character has uh has been just starting down i've just been starting down my road to trying to be to listen more to what people are saying and to try not to be emotionally reactive. And I wanted to be emotionally reactive and I was feeling, but I've, I've like, I've been going, I've been doing my therapy and learning to listen a little bit more. And so I think I was really uncomfortable, but I also like Chelsea. She's my colleague. And I was kind of trying to, because the, I could feel the dynamics in the room shifting, like we had two people who were on Chelsea's side. And I felt like Bailey was sort of about to go down with her ship. And I didn't want to be on that ship with her. <laughs> Well, very good point. I mean, just one intervention, one person can shift the dynamics and within the group, right? The power dynamics, like even if it was just one of them who had come in uh, and even when someone did earlier, Chelsea felt more validated by that. And I saw Callum and Bailey shut up a little bit. <laughs> Christina, did you have something you wanted to share? 
I think one of the downsides is that we actually didn't get to hear Chelsea's story. And I think that when it comes to like situations like this, it's like, yeah, sure, we could tell him to stop and we can say things to kill him and Bailey like, well, you know, you're invalidating her or whatever. But I think like then it's kind of like Chelsea really didn't get to express herself or explain. And I think it's nice to give this like safe space for Chelsea. But at the same time, it's like Mm -hmm. other like, you know, the other people were kind of like usurping her actual emotional feelings and like maybe because we didn't get to finish the conversation but i would have liked to hear more what chelsea had to say thank you and again gains and losses right we're not going to get it right every time or we're not going to have it's very rare that we will have an all oh everyone heard they all have a different idea about how to think about um profiling and we're good you know um and I think that um, it's useful and important to, to remember that, yes, it does take many times for interventions to impact people. Um, and you might not necessarily change someone's mind, but even for Chelsea, like even hearing, I would I would be willing to say something like this again, as opposed to shutting my mouth completely, is feels like a huge gain. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're going until three, We've got 10 minutes left. We have one more scenario that I wanted to share with you all. Um, and I don't know that we will get too much time to do the interventions on it, but uh, it's actually a, in a classroom. And uh, I think we're just gonna plant it with you all as, see, as food for thought. Like, what would you do if you were, and I know not all of you are faculty members, but if, if or instructors, but if, um, but just imagining uh, if you were maybe even in the class, what would you potentially do or say um, based on the dynamics that are going down? So again, I'm going to have you turn off your cameras and we will have the class. Hello, class. So um, I want to continue our discussion from last week and talk about the readings on environmental justice. Oh yeah, mm. did you see the YouTube video about this? It was um, I think about like the not in my backyard movement. It totally relates to this. There was uh, like a landfill in some minority neighborhood in New Jersey. Yeah, I saw that too. It was so heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, I was like crying when I saw it. I wish I could just like, I don't know, adopt all those kids. Like they're in such a horrible like situation of like, oh, just those conditions they're in. It's like, um, I actually bookmarked the video. You guys want to check it out? Um, I, actually, let's just focus on the readings for today. Yeah, yeah. I thought the readings were, yeah, pretty awesome. Um, the author made some really good points. Actually, I had a different opinion than the author who wrote that, and he didn't consider the implication. Really? I, I mean, I guess, like, I didn't agree with everything he wrote either, but, like, you know, it was really interesting. I just didn't think he took marginalized communities into account, for example. Oh, when... man, the research could apply to anyone. It's not always about race. I wasn't actually talking about race, Mark. I, I'm just saying that the author should well, have- I just thought the readings were really cool. Okay, let's come back together. Cameras on, please. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so what yeah cringe some mansplaining going on what else are y'all noticing get these <laughs> realistic yeah yeah MG. Oh, a lot of privilege flaunting of white his privilege just eating being slouchy not specific about the article and then not taking his peers uh interpretations and their words seriously just flaunting privilege. So what would you all do? What if what if this was one of your students? What, what's your role as educators? What could you do? 
in a situation like this? When somebody like Mark interrupts another student when they're speaking, my first initial response is like, thank you, Mark. Okay, okay, Mark, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I want to hear, Monica, please continue what you were saying about what you're, you know, because as the instructor, you're you're the, the, the authority figure and you're the one that can put a stop to that. And if somebody like Mark keeps going, you just have to be polite and just like, you know, oh, really good point what you were saying. And I really appreciate the YouTube video, but I'll, what, what does Monica have to say? And you, know, you just have to like, sometimes you have to keep interrupting Mark to stop talking, to listen to, to Monica. What else are y'all noticing? And does it make, do, does your identity play in, in your, in your feelings around your opportunity to interrupt or? Um, can you ask the question again? I don't understand the question. Well, uh, well, I'm actually just thinking like, what are you, what are you thinking about this? How might you handle it? Might it be a little different than Christina handled it? What are some of the other ways? I, I think I would focus on Monica and say, hey, finish what you were saying. Hold on one second. Just go, you had a good thought there. Let's, let's, let's bring that out a little bit more. Don't be afraid to just push your way in and, and say what you're trying to say here. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think as an instructor, it's probably important to set ground rules for conversations before the conversation starts. So that, and then when a Mark takes over, you can say, wait a minute, we've got some ground rules here, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, but Mark's just being enthusiastic. Mark is excited to be in your class. That, which is wonderful, but we have ground rules for conversation. And I love that enthusiasm, Mark. We need to let everybody have a say. You just keep bringing that back to know the ground rules are, and we all agreed to them, remember? Do y'all think that uh, there was something going on with Haifa uh, as the instructor here? Yeah. <laughs> I'm open to I, I that. I thought that Haifa wasn't actually really listening. <laughs> <laughs> very, very well. Like when Mark pointed out the, the point about the uh, YouTube video, like I was like, okay, let's just get back to the reading. It's like, I think when you have somebody who's very enthusiastic, even when there's somebody as overbearing as Mark's character, it's like, you still have to respect the interest that they've taken and that they've like gone and looked at other things. And I think that to be able to make a comment of like, wow, that's really cool. Thank you for the YouTube video. And I understand what you mean about like, being passionate, you know, to just make a comment on what he said about his enthusiasm and then mm. slowly bring it back. Let's, you know, or, you know, to redirect it. How does this relate to the reading? Let's talk about the reading and then maybe start asking direct questions to other students. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I wonder if his reaction was almost like a mini tantrum to not feeling validated earlier, you know, because like you said, he was so excited and then teacher's like, okay, we'll redirect. What do you think of the book? Well, whatever, fine. And, you know, maybe he was taking out his frustration on the other student because he had been dismissed. You know, I don't know. Yeah, great point. So I'm getting so sad because we have like three minutes left and I, um, I would love to just hear some of the takeaways like that you have, uh, this time was short. We covered a lot. We touched on some pretty intense topics. We didn't find all the answers, um, but I am curious about some of your takeaways, either in the chat or out loud. What are you thinking about in relation to the stuff we've done today? I always think it's helpful to practice something that's difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm always hesitant to cross anybody who I disagree with. So this is really helpful to be able to just try it out in a safe space and kind of get the words in my head. That's Thank you. Question. Thanks for, and thanks for being willing and, and brave to try in this space. What else, other takeaways? I, I think that the, this is really good to be able to see how like these 
that racism and sexism and all these isms that they manifest themselves in minor small ways and it's good to be able to identify those small ways but i just it's like it's also easy to to realize that we're in this exercise and these conversations we're going to have microaggressions so we're already heightened to look for it but in the real world these conversations happen often all you know all the time and it's like are we all going to be prepared to see it and have those like ideas in the back of our head, like the, the you know, prepared to, sh to shoot off. And that's what I really hope. And like Doe said, it's just practice, 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 I guess, but. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else anyone wants to share? Well, super appreciate you all. Um, appreciate the folks that shared and for folks willing to, brave enough to try. I also heard a, a, a request uh, that more people be taking this work on and that it's not only the folks of color that are sharing, that are having these conversations. And um, yeah, I really appreciate y'all. Thanks so much for inviting us to spend time with you. We do have an evaluation. We'll probably ask Mark or Matt to share out with everyone. So if um, if y'all could take a moment to do that at some point, we'd really appreciate it. And thanks everyone. Um, I'll stay on for a moment. RFL, if y'all want to meet back in our rehearsal room for a couple minutes, if you have it. Thanks. So Abigail, thank you on behalf of the COD community and Guided Pathways. We really appreciate you guys coming and it was uh, fantastic to see this for a second time around. And just as some people mentioned, it's one thing practicing in a, in a closed group like this. It's the other thing is then being able to take these strategies into real practice. And I thank you very much for setting this up and I hope um, we all can continue to work on these foundations and principles and make our community as welcoming as possible. So for all those that attended, thank you again for attending. Um, again, it ended at three o'clock and I do appreciate everyone that was willing to participate in this uh, session. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for the invite, Matthew. You're welcome. Have you? It was great. I mean, your team is just good. Y'all remember, and it was uh, fantastic how he was able to take those ideas and interpret that um, new scenario for number two. Is uh, yeah. Well, and it seemed like that was. Uh, I think we're gonna keep using that one because it certainly struck a chord with people. So thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. So you said there's an uh, evaluations. Yeah, um, Bailey will send you, uh, or I will send you a Qualtrics link, and if we, you could send that out to the registrants, uh, it'd be super. I would love to get some feedback from people. Yes, we can definitely do that. Cool. All right, thanks. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye.